Welcome back to Module 4. In this section, we're going to be introducing a diagram that astronomers use to um, kind of track different trends in stellar properties that is going to be really essential to our understanding as we head into the evolution of stars in Module 5. So that's going to be our big focus of this section um, where we're following part of Chapter 18 in OpenStax Astronomy. Now, uh, when we think about all the different types of stars that we can have, we introduced the stellar types in the previous video, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. We introduced the fact that there are these brown dwarfs also um, that are not a type of star. They are smaller and colder than M stars at the end of the line. Um, when we want to know how many of each of these types of stars are out there, that's a lot harder to do because we have to make sure that we've counted all of them. So if we think about a census in um, our everyday lives, a census uh, occurs every so often and it defines the boundaries of a region that we want to count all of the people in. So Grand Rapids City might do a census and count everyone in the city limits. The country does a census um, that tries to count every single citizen. and there's this procedure for trying to make sure that everyone is counted. Mailers get sent out and we hope that everyone turns their forms back, but for locations that don't have forms um, returned, we have to follow up and, and kind of knock on doors and hope that people answer. If we think about this same thing for stars, we can kind of think about the, um, the brightness of stars as being the people most eager to fill out their census forms. The really big and bright O and B stars are going to be the people that turn in their form the same day they receive it, they get it back in the mail, and they know for sure they're going to be counted. They're easy to find, they're easy to count, um, and we're not going to miss any of them. On the other side of the um, set of stellar types, M stars are very dim, it would be really possible that we that we don't get a chance to count them. They didn't submit their forms through the mail, and when we knocked on their door, they didn't answer. So there is a potential for a selection bias where we are more likely to undercount dim things, dim and small things, than we are um, to somehow miss one of the brightest types of objects. And of course, we have to define our survey. We don't have a city limit in space, so we have to choose one, and we call that the solar neighborhood. We count out to a certain volume in space that we feel confident that our telescope technologies being used for the survey will be able to find everything that we're looking for, and we call that the solar neighborhood. So a big bubble surrounding us, all the people that we're next to. So when we think about our own sun, I want you to pause for a moment and consider the question at the bottom of this slide. You don't need to know the correct answer. I just want you to get a sense of um, from anything that you've that you've known about before this class or just your general feel for the stars that you see out in the nighttime sky. Do you feel like the sun is an average star? Do you think it's especially bright? Do you think it's especially dim, especially big or small, hot or cold? Um, how do you think it compares to everything else? So take a moment to think. And when you're ready with your guess, we'll, we'll move on to the results of the census. In our neighborhood, M stars are by far the most common. And I want us to stop and recognize something important here. Those are the ones that are most likely to be missed in our census counts because they are dim and small and hard to find. So the fact that over 50% of all of the stars in the volume around us are M stars tells us that they are definitely the most common type of star that exists, the most common type of star that gets made. The second most common type of star is a K type star, so slightly brighter and bigger than M stars. And then G stars like our sun uh, make up about 4% of our solar neighborhood, so we're actually on when we, when we look not at the possibilities for stars, but when we look at the actual stars that inv are involved, the sun is actually on the brighter side. It might be an average star for the kinds of stars that can get made, but for the stars that actually do get made, it is quite bright. Now, brown dwarfs and white dwarfs are also indicated here. We have already talked about brown dwarfs. They are failed stars. 
We have not yet talked much about white dwarfs. That term is going to come up again later in this video, and then it will be expanded on and explained more um, in Module 6 when we talk about what happens to stars over the course of their lives. But as a kind of preview of that, white dwarfs are the um, leftover dead cores of stars that used to be um, kind of regular low mass stars, like a G or a K star, perhaps. And if we look, something really important comes up too. There are zero, none, zero O and B stars in our neighborhood. That is also really interesting and extremely useful for us because it is only those O and B type stars that have the possibility of exploding at the end of their lives. So we have a nice safe solar neighborhood, no supernova um, are going to be occurring near us anytime soon. All right, so let's move on. So we talked about the fact that the sun is remarkably bright compared to the solar neighborhood population, but it's still called a yellow dwarf star. And it is still relatively small compared to the objects that can be counted in these M stars, um, red giants. Stars get very um, puffed up at the end of their lifetime. That's something that we're going to be talking about in upcoming videos in Module 5. Um, and there's a really neat video, I encourage you to click it, that kind of walks you through um, the different size scales, starting with the solar system. So starting with the planets and the size scales that we were already trying to practice our understanding of in Module um, 2. We get to continue with that, uh, adding stars, regular kinds of stars, and giants and supergiants uh, beyond that. So a cool video that's linked in the posted slides. So now we get back to the equation that we had on the previous uh, video. We introduced the term luminosity. We described that that tells us about the absolute brightness of the star. It's the power output of the star, the energy generation rate per time. And it cares about the surface area of the star, big stars and small stars, as well as the black body radiation. So the black body flux, which um, is based on temperature uh, entirely. So bright stars could be big, they could be hot, or both of those things could be true. Now one of the things that astronomers really wanted to know is can we move beyond just an equation and actually plot out stars as a function of maybe size and temperature or luminosity and, and size or luminosity and temperature and see like groupings of stars. So there were two different uh, scientists that at roughly the same time were working with star data sets and created all of these different plots and there was one that they both kind of honed in on as being particularly interesting, that the stars were grouped in a very interesting sort of way, not along a single straight line, because you can just write down an equation for that, but rather in very distinct locations that was saying a lot more about those stars than simply numbers uh, corresponding to their size and temperature, things like that. That leads us then to the diagram named after these two different scientists, Einar Hertzsprung in Europe and Henry Norris Russell um, in North America. And we get the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's a lot to write down, so we often call it the HR diagram. And it is so important that we understand the HR diagram, that we can draw our own HR diagram, and that we know what we're referring to when we use that term, when we use that phrase. So the HR diagram uses the spectral types that we introduced in the previous slide, uh, the previous video. So the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, where O is the hotter side of the temperatures, M is the colder side of the temperatures, which means that when we lay out those spectral types, temperature is actually increasing to the left on the plot. So that is something to be aware of is that the temperature increases to the left on the plot. And then vertically, we're plotting luminosity or absolute magnitude. We introduced the magnitude scale in the previous uh, video, where magnitude is a unit, uh, and we're just describing brightness. So this is the true intrinsic brightness, the real actual brightness, the light bulb that has 100 watts pr printed on it, because we know that's how bright it's supposed to be. That's how bright these stars are, no matter where we're watching them. Brighter stars would be at the top of the diagram, and dimmer stars would be at the bottom. 
Now there are a lot of different ways to draw these diagrams and we're going to see a lot over the course of our um, time together both in the textbook and in resources that you're looking up for projects and any labs that we do and so I want to display at least two different ones um, for you here. Note that in both cases we see this kind of curvy line from the upper left to the lower right, so a diagonal area. Then there's a big set of stars in the upper right, and then there is a small set of stars in the lower left where there's a big gap between um, the, the main diagonal and that lower set of stars. In both of these images, the luminosity is shown on the left as the vertical axis where we're using units relative to the sun, so a luminosity of 1 is 1 solar luminosity. A luminosity of 10 means 10 times brighter than the sun. Horizontally, on the left picture, we show spectral class at the very top of the screen, uh, O on the left, M on the right. We've also got temperatures li listed at the top of the screen. So there's 30,000 Kelvin on the left and 3,000 Kelvin on the right. And on that left image, we also show um, that color term, B minus V. That's the color index that I briefly mentioned in the previous video that we aren't going to be using again. So I wanted to show what, it's, um, what it can be used for. It is taking the place of temperatures because we know that color is based on temperature from Wien's Law. And it can also be used instead of spectral classes. So it's a third type of thing telling us the same piece of information. On the right image, we have just the surface temperature shown, um, again, 30,000 to 3,000, where in both of those cases, that is not a linear scale. There are some main regions that we want to become familiar with in this lecture section and beyond. So the term main sequence is very important for us. Main sequence refers to that big diagonal curvy line from the upper left to the bottom right where all stars on the main sequence are actively turning hydrogen into helium. The sun is one of those examples. The sun is currently turning hydrogen into helium. All stars spend 90% of their lives on the main sequence. That term is going to be very important to us, so let's put it into our notes, let's put it into our mental framework um, right away. Then we had giants and supergiants, often referred to as red giants, but we can see in both images there seem to be yellow giants as well. There seem to be things that are high up in the middle of the chart that are blue supergiants. So just the description of giant and supergiant is telling us something about their physical sizes. And then in the bottom left we have white dwarfs that is the official name for these objects, even if they are blue in color. That category of object is called a white dwarf. And only some stars will leave behind a white dwarf. That is a big part of our Module 5 understanding. So we're introducing this diagram because it's essential to us now, but we will be expanding our understanding um, in the next module over the course of several videos. All right, now if we look at all of these things, the terms dwarfs and giants are also hinting at radius information because if we look, none of the axes are currently showing us radius information, but we know from one slide back that, um, two slides back, that if we know the luminosity and we know the temperature, we can calculate the radius. So the fact that we are plotting luminosity and temperature means radius is inherently in this diagram and it's going from smallest things in the bottom left to biggest things in the upper right. The dwarfs are in one part of the uh, plot and the giants and supergiants are in the other side of the plot. Okay, so pause for as long as you need to and please actually pause and go through all of this because this is a really important self-check. So pause the video, read through all the questions, write down answers to each one of them, and only unpause when you're ready. One last chance to pause if you didn't. Okay. So the hottest stars are found on the left side of the plot. If you wrote something other than left, if you wrote upper left or you specified, we actually really just want it to be the left side because we can have hot stars that are also bright and we can have hot stars that are cool. Uh, 
We can have hot stars that are dim. Sorry. Coldest stars. I was jumping ahead. The coldest stars are on the far right of the image. And again, if you specified top right or bottom right, we want to fix that. It's just the right side because we can have cold stars that are on the main sequence, but we can also have cold stars that are giants and supergiants. It's only the far right that is indicating temperature. The dimmest stars are on the whole bottom of the plot. So we just want the bottom um, of the plot, not the lower left, not the lower right, the whole bottom. White dwarfs are dim and so are um, M stars on the main sequence. For bright stars, we just want it to be the top, right? We don't want to say top left or top right. We don't want to specify like that because brightest is just a vertical axis piece of information. We can have really bright O stars on the main sequence. We can also have really bright supergiant stars because they've just gotten so big they're producing a lot of brightness. And then these last two we do have to specify. The smallest stars are in the lower left corner. We do have to specify the lower left corner for the smallest stars. White dwarfs, that term dwarf is giving us that hint. We are going to eventually learn that these white dwarfs are about the physical size of Earth. They are very much crunched down from star sizes. And then the largest stars we have to specify are in the upper right. The giant and supergiant names really help to kind of let us know that those objects are much bigger than the sun. They are going to be a hundred times across or a thousand times across compared to the sun, and they are only in the upper left to get those really big um, radius numbers. So if you had trouble with any of these, I encourage you to kind of make a note that maybe you, this is something you come back to and you double check later on. You don't have to rewatch the video, but you can kind of check with the slides in front of you and then go back to your notes to, to see if you were right. But I really want you to feel confident answering all of these by the time that we see questions about this on a project or a lab or any other assessment. That's where we're going to leave this video. Um, when we start back up with the last section of this module, we're going to be introducing a couple of other stellar properties that we have not yet learned what astronomers are able to do or how astronomers are able to measure them. So that's going to be the mass of stars, which we've not yet discussed, and the distance to stars, which we would think is something we really care about and we do, but it's one of the toughest things to measure in astronomy. So I'll see you in that last video of Module 4. Thanks for watching.